We have uh, taken up our positions as the uh, as Hope Church here, and literally as we are standing in, in the name of Christ, Lord God, we will walk out as we go out, Lord God, with uh, fully armored and fully equipped with grace and with faith and with hope to bring people into your fold. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Why don't you turn to somebody, walk up to someone. You may be a little cold today. Just walk over to somebody. Let, let the blood moving, let the cre legs moving and uh, wish everyone out there. And do some exercise, just push-ups, a few if you need to. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. So the team up there, we are doing good? We are good. Thank you, Ron. You. We need people to shoot trouble away. Amen. <clears throat> Let's just uh, pause for, for a moment. Take a deep breath. Get yourself into the place where you can hear the voice of God. And every other voice will be filtered away. The Holy Spirit will put a shield around us that we might hear our good shepherd speak. Amen. Amen. We all need our good shepherd feeding us with his word. I need to be fed on his word and uh, daily, on a daily basis. So that's why I so encourage you to uh, keep reading the word. The, uh, our pastor friend from Fiji, he sent me a text message. Said, uh, All we need is the word of God. And I said, yes, the word of God is, is like an anchor to our soul in a stormy world. Think of that, you know, so much storms that are going on, all kinds of storms, but God's word. So, so let's look into what God has for us today. How many of you heard this country called Nepal? Nepal from, you know, by Mount Everest, you know. Did you know that this is only one of the only predominantly Hindu nation? Fully, fully Hindu country. But it, was, but it was the birthplace of Buddhism. Interestingly, the founder of uh, uh, the Buddhism, Siddhartha Gautam, uh, was born there. And uh, it was the birthplace, Nepal. And um, according to C. Peter Wagner, one of these um, uh, uh, world missions experts, uh, a church growth expert at Fuller Theological Seminary, he says, Many missiologists consider the Himalayan region a hopeless case for Christianity. They kind of wrote it all, hopeless case. However, God's plans are different, right? When what we think there's one country is hopeless, could never be reached, but God has a way. Several years ago, uh, the Lord saved one man by name Lok Bandhari. Uh, a revolutionary freedom fighter, uh, a national martial arts champion. His father was grooming him to become the prime minister of Nepal, and God saved him. Uh, and today, Lok is an ambassador for Christ. We will be dwelling on that. He was an ambassador, he is an ambassador for Christ in his home country. And uh, he is not discouraged by the fact that he has been detained and, uh, and arrested for more than 30 times and put into prison, and he was persecuted for what? Preaching the gospel, like the Apostle Paul. In a hopeless country, God raised someone who could bring forth hope there, right? 
And now Locke, uh, he tells to the crowds of 65 to 75,000 people in bigger groups and uh, how Christ has changed his life and how he, he was revolutionized uh, his life. And, uh, uh, um, it, it, you know, just to think about uh, uh, why this became a Christian, why it became a Hindu nation, uh, is, uh, but it's not always been like that. The first time the missions uh, approach there uh, was started by Catholic uh, priests, uh, St. Francis of uh, Assisi Order. They were the one first missionaries to go into in 1715. But then things have changed off and then became uh, hostile to Christians and all became a, 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 a anti-Christian. But now God saved this Lok um, Bandari. Now, according to some estimations, that there are three million Christians in Nepal. Three millions. It's a great work of God. Considering that 50 years ago, there were no, no, there were no known Christians recordingly, uh, in, in, on record. It was 50 years ago. But things have changed. What was the reason for that? Why this kind of a, a, a turnaround? I believe and I attribute all that for the, the great work of God through Christians like Lok Bandari, whose life was transformed by the love of Christ. A revolutionary freedom fighter became an ambassador for Christ. Amen? He decided not to live for himself, but for the one who died to give him life. Life eternal. Dear friends, not only in Nepal, but we see such faithful followers of Christ everywhere preaching the good news of the gospel. Amen? So this world will be saved. There is hope for this world. It will not be, as they, they said, hopeless for Christianity. But there is hope here. So what does that have to do with our study today? We have been studying through the letters of Paul to Corinthian church, chapters 3 and 4, uh, we've learned about uh, um, uh, what, what, does hap what happens to our mortal bodies. You know, we've been thinking quite a bit about death, and uh, it's okay to talk about those things. Nothing wrong, nothing wrong about that. However painful it may be, it's a good thing we t talk about those uh, uh, matters of life and death. So we talked about what would happen to this mortal body, uh, I think Kathy reminded us again about folding of the tent and all that, right? So that's, it's good to have these conversations and uh, keep ourselves ready. And, uh, uh, and also we learned that uh, uh, in light of all that's going to happen to us, what should be our ambition in life? What should be the right ambition? What would be that? That is to please the Lord. Either through life or through death, we want to please the Lord. That is our, the right ambition. So in today's passage, we will see how uh, pleasing God, wanting to say we've got to please God, but how does that work? How does it manifest in our lives? How pleasing God works out in our lives as we look at how uh, the apostles uh, persuaded others and what controlled them in their persuasion. Questions like why did Christ die for us? And what is expected of Christians who are saved by grace? And what are Christians called in the scriptures? And what is the task and what is the message that God has entrusted to you and me if you call yourself the follower of Christ? Would you like to know answers to these questions? What a great excitement I see here. Would you like to know the answers? Yeah. Yes. I like that. You know, just sometimes, you know, you got to shout in such a way that I, I should fall back. No, don't do that. <laughs> uh, but uh, let's explore and get some of these answers as we go forward. Um, verses 11 and 13. Because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. God knows we are sincere. 
And I hope you know this too. Are we commending ourselves to you again? Do we have to bring that commendations? No, we are giving you a reason to take pride in us. That's what he was saying. We are giving you a reason to be proud of us so you can answer those who brag about having a spectacular ministry rather than having a sincere heart. If it seems we are crazy, it is to bring glory to God. And if we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. You know, they used to have these t-shirts in those days, all kinds of t-shirt messages, right? One t-shirt used to say, I am fool for Christ on the front. At the back it says, whose fool are you? I don't mind to be a fool for Christ. Amen? That's what Paul is saying. If you're crazy for God, yes. That is, okay, if you think you are crazy, it's to bring glory to God. Sometimes we are so modest and so decent, you know, we don't want to be uh, seen or perceived as a little bit, a little bit crazy or a little bit uh, fanatic when it comes to the Lord. That's okay. Let's be fanatic for Jesus. Be, uh, 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 go all out for Christ. So these are a few verses that's beautifully put here. Uh, I picked up a few things here. After addressing the, the inevitable uh, matters of life and l after life, Paul was having to do some defense work here. He was to defend his uh, credentials uh, regarding his ministry among the Corinthian believers. Why? Because in chapters 3 and 4, we learn how some people were trying to throw mud at his ministry. Remember? They were discrediting him. He's not, he's not an apostle. He doesn't have what it takes to be an apostle of Christ and so on and so forth. So out of the reverential fear of God, when he says we understand our fearful responsibility means he is having the reverence, reverential fear of God. He's not that, oh, God is going to punish me kind of a fear, but he had that reverence uh, uh, of God. So out of that fear of God, he went on persuading people, talking to people, uh, in the even in the Corinthian church. Some in the Corinthian church did not believe Paul's uh, credentials. So he was persuading them uh, out of the fear of the Lord, how authentic he was. He actually literally studied uh, to be uh, the, the minister of God's word. You know, they, sometimes I find it in India, quite a few people get these uh, uh, doctorate degrees and uh, all kinds of uh, credentials without even having to go to a Bible college. But Paul here says, you know, how authentic he was. He studied under, the, under Gamaliel, you know, the, one of the Harvard professors types. And, um, uh, uh, and then he was persuading them with that, such reverence. But uh, he was saying that none of these false guys, false prophets, uh, are, are, are true prophets, are apostles as they claim to be. So that's the kind of persuasion that he was going on. So in the, as, as he began to have that argument, the concern, he picked up something here. That it was apparent that some false prophets were bragging or, or they were priding themselves in outward appearances or bragging about their achievements or their uh, accomplishments, what all, what all they, they, they did or their apparent success. All these numbers and kind of, kind of thing, you know, you know how many uh, uh, the, uh, people or what all these great, these great things that we're doing kind of thing that they were bragging about. And how was Paul on the other hand? He was humble. He was contrite. And he was taken in a humble position. Uh, and, uh, uh, and he says, we come to you in weakness, things like that. And uh, because he was paying more attention to not on the outward success, but on the inward heart, what is going on in his own heart. He was, he was 
looking at his sincerity of his own heart. He's paying attention to what's going on in your heart, in our hearts. How many of us pay attention to what's going on in our hearts these days, right? You know, what, what goes on the outside is one thing. What goes on the inside is something else. What goes on in your heart is known to you, to who? Only to you and to the Lord. I don't know what's going on in your heart. So pause and pay attention to your, what's going on? What's going on over there? That's what Paul is looking at here. So Paul was reminding the Corinthian Christians to watch their hearts and remain sincere in their service to God and to one another. I tell you, dear friends, there's always been, then even more so now, an emphasis on outward appearances and performances. Is it not? These days, all what about the, uh, all the, w the world outside is all about what, uh, how many clients that we have or how many uh, 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 accounts that the bank is op able to open up or what kind of numbers, the business, you know, what is our poll ratings? The, for the politician is all about what? The poll ratings, all about the outward uh, 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 spectacular things they want to do uh, uh, and to please people. There's always been that. We see here and now too. But God is this bothered about it. Amen. God does, doesn't care about the crowds or the, the crowd size. You know, sometimes when uh, some people look at our church and say, oh, what's happening over here? You know, pa pa people doesn't, God doesn't care about the numbers. It's good. We have more people uh, hearing the word of God. But what God cares more is about your heart and my heart. Do you say amen for that? Amen. So is God, God is looking at your heart and my heart today. Paul is bringing that. Dear friends, even Christian ministry these days have this kind of uh, focuses. Christian ministry is not all about performing spectacular things for, for God. But, but doing it with a sincere heart, that's what matters. But in a highly consumerist, wor consumerist world that people want to do, what, spectacular things as if the, uh, what, uh, on Facebook, the likes or the, 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 the Instagrams or uh, the media m matters more. So there are some people, some people, churches are moving in that way. But on the other hand, God is not looking at the spectacular ministries, but sincerity of your heart. Look at, uh, for, uh, for example, if you look at Sa Samuel 16th chapter, verse 7, uh, uh, what, uh, what, is the co what is the context over there uh, for that is uh, Samuel was sent to the house of Jesse. Uh, Jesse has some children there, and then uh, uh, God says, one of the kids of Jesse, that you're going to anoint them as a king of, the, of, of Israel. So Samuel says, okay, how many sons do you have? He said, okay, one, two, three, four. So bring them on. The first guy comes because he wanted the eldest to be the, the next king of Israel, right? So he brings the, uh, uh, someone, his name is Eliab. He comes in tall, strong, and big, and hard, all, these, all these big qualities of being a king. He, and then Samuel thinks, wow, oh, here he is. The next king of Israel. That was his uh, apparent conclusion. And then he was going to give a certificate, take an oil and pour over him. But the Lord says, uh-uh. Nope. I don't, not this guy. Now what do you think, what made Samuel to think that he, he, he may be the king of Israel? What do you think? What, what, was the, uh, what was the outward appearance like here? Strong muscle guy, right? Like uh, King Saul, the previous Saul was very tall. So he must have been very tall and all that. So we, he, he fell for that. But then God says, I've got something better. What I'm looking, what you're looking is different than what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is this. The Lord does not see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Do you say amen for that? Today, what God is looking at? Your heart and my heart. 
but people pay all big, huge attention to what's going on on that. So, dear friends, it says, because God looks at the heart, how are we to behave ourselves? How are we to conduct ourselves? In Colossians, Paul writes to uh, um, the Colossian uh, believers. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I don't have that scripture there. Could you turn with me to Colossians third chapter, please, uh, to uh, verse 23. Colossians 3, verse 23. Let me read it from, from 23 onwards. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you're serving is Christ. But if you do what is wrong, you will be paid back for the wrong you have done for God has no favorites. See, God is looking at our heart. How are we to? We got to do everything as if we're doing it unto the Lord. Here the context is the ministry of the word, the preaching, and all those ministry, uh, ministry things that we do. But in many, in all works, uh, in the church, whatever we do, even when we go out to Sharon Day events, we do with sincerity. When we play, play the music, we play with sincerity of our heart. Uh, it, because you're not doing it for me or not doing it for anybody else. Who are we doing this? For the Lord. So the Lord watches your heart. The Lord looks at you. It's not what you do matters, but how you do matters the most. Amen? So that's what you look at. Sincere. Not a spectacular ministry, but a sincerity of the heart. So let's move on here uh, from um, verse 14 and 15. He says, either way... Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for, for us all, we also believe that we have all died to our Lord, our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So Paul was building on the theme of uh, the right ambition of pleasing God, right? He was saying, whatever we do, either way, there's something is motivating us, something that is controlling us, something that is uh, 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 moving us forward. Here the word it says, uh, uh, um, Christ's love controls us. Well, some of us have a hard time with the word control. Rightly so. Because we often associate the word control with authority, with command, or power, or, or, or swaying somebody, you know, to do what you want him or her to do. And none of us like to be controlled, especially when people abuse their authority uh, and leadership. We don't like to be controlled. But this is not how with Christ's love. Christ's love does not push us or, or, or manipulate us to do things. Our Christ's love, his, his love uh, is beautifully, what it does is that it's not, uh, not, it doesn't put his authority over, oh, I'm saying so, you got to do this. Not that kind of thing, not kind of uh, 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 obedience, uh, uh, or forced obedience. Rather, it, is, it implores us. It urges us. It, it pleads with us. Or, or it kind of uh, uh, compels us to action. Or it motivates us, leads us in such a way. That's how the, the Christ's love works. Remember Jesus even said, uh, uh, you obey my, if you love me, you obey my commandments. So what comes first? Obedience or loving comes first? Love. So that's how Christ's love uh, out of love for, 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 for us, he, he, he died on the cross. That's what Paul was saying here. So the love of Christ compels us. So he was describing that powerful, spirit-filled motivation that drives followers of Christ to share the gospel in ways that persuade people to commit their lives to Jesus. The love of Christ. Why do we do this? 
Because God loves you. God's love is motivating us. Romans, first chapter, verse 16, uh, 16. Out of the compelling love of Christ, this is what Paul, Paul has always approached that. Because of the love of Christ. He says in verse uh, 16, For I am not ashamed of the good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. Because of God's love compelling him, he was not ashamed of the good news. First Corinthians 9, chapter, verse 6, we read the same similar uh, approach here. Yet preaching the good news is not something I can boast about. I am compelled by God to do it. How terrible for me if I didn't preach the good news. So how do you and I approach when it comes to preaching the, the good news of the gospel? Are we ashamed of it? I was when I was uh, in high school uh, back in India, surrounded by a lot of Hindu uh, fam friends of mine. I was ashamed to tell myself I was a Christian. But later on, that was all gone. And I, uh, some American missionaries came to India and they said to me, uh, your name is Francis. Are you not afraid of keeping that Christian name, Francis, in a Hindu country? I said, no. What will they do to me? If they, all they can do maybe is to kill me, kill my body, but they cannot touch my soul. My soul is with God. Amen? It is protected and preserved. So therefore, let's not be ashamed of what man can do to us. The least they could do is to destroy this, this tent of ours. But we have a secure. You know, that's why Jesus, we are secure. You know, we are singing that song, In Him. So he says, it's how terrible for me if I didn't preach the good news. See, dear friends, because of Christ's love for his people, he died for us while we were yet sinners. And that love of Christ compelled Apostle Paul to share the gospel. And it motivated him to take the gospel to distant lands in the face of persecution and the opposition. And Paul was willing to die to himself. Not only to his own self, but all literally, he was willing to let go of his own life. In Galatians, says, the second chapter, verse 20, he says, I no longer I live, but Christ lives in me. Remember that passage? You know, the life, the life now I live, I live by the faith in the one who died and rose up for me. So that is Paul's resolve. And what should be our resolve? So this testimony of Paul encourages you and me to ask ourselves these questions. What motivates us to share the good news of Jesus with others? If the love of Christ compels us, we will not live for ourselves. Amen? We will not live for our own selves. Instead, what we, who do we live for? For Christ who died for us. And we will, we will go anywhere he leads us. Anywhere, we will follow him. And I used to tell when I was a young Christian to the Lord uh, in YWAM India, I used to say, Lord, wherever you will lead me, I will follow. And whatever you feed me, I will follow. Uh, well, I tell you, he, he, he fed me good food, though, not snakes and scorpions and all kinds of things. But that was my resolve. I said, Lord, here I am. I'm following you. As a young Christian, I used to... Uh, go through these villages in India and preach the good news of the gospel because of the love of God compelled me and it, it, uh, the love of God still compels me to do this. And so we're willing to go anywhere to bring the good news of the gospel. So it means after church, we can take a walk to the lake, right? Well, if pastor, you have something else to do. Yes, I agree. I understand. But I'm just saying we are willing to do any and everything as the, as the Lord compels us, the love of God compels us to do. So let's move on to this. From this, God doesn't look at the spectacular ministry, but he looks at your sincere heart. And what should be our motivation in all what we do is the love of God that compels us. And then he brings an important aspect that I would like to dwell here from verses 18 to 21 
uh, I, I, I have no time to read that. But if you look through these 18 to 21, as you go back, these verses are talking about how God uh, um, brought us back to himself while we were being the enemies through Christ and his mercy and in his love. And you and I coming back to the Lord and being reconciled with Christ. In other words, we were enemies, but God brought us back into friendship with him. All that was, all that was possible because God loved us. And I tell you, you and I did not do anything to earn that, to receive that. Paul says, all was what? Gift of God. So the greatest gift that you can ever receive from God or from or you can give to anybody else in the is is the gift of salvation. Or means introducing people to Christ. That is the best thing you can do. You may not be able to convince them, you may not be able to persuade them like Paul did, but if you can lead them to Christ and let Christ do the rest. So that's why we do these opportunities putting ourselves out in the, in, the, in the community. Well, it would, it, be, it would be nice, we'll go and watch a baseball game or, or, or some football game, would be nice. But why we want to go there to be there is at least through our efforts, we can bring somebody to Christ. That's our job as Christians. That's what Paul is talking about, the, the job of leading people back to God. You know, but Paul gave a, a very fancy title for that job. You know, he called it very fancy, fancy title for this reconciliation job. Uh, you know, he called it as, we are God's ambassadors. Paul, let, let, your, let little pride swell up in your heart. You are being called to be the ambassador. A nomination is coming right now. I tell you, it will be approved without any opposition uh, in the, in the, wherever that is. Amen? It will be approved because God is appointing you and me. He has done that as an ambassador of Christ. How, uh, Calvin, you are, you are uh, an ambassador for Christ. Amen? And Keith, you are an ambassador for Christ. What a great title. Put a, put a suit and all that and say, I am the ambassador of Christ. So turn to somebody and say, you are the ambassador of Christ. Hello, up there, you are. Don't you ever underestimate who you are. Well, having done the little uh, uh, pr prideful talk, what does it take to be an ambassador of Christ? What does an ambassador? What does he do or what does she do? An ambassador of Christ, you know, it's a, uh, 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 in the real time ambassadors, of ambassadors, what do they do? A, a, an ambassador of Christ is an official representative of their government. She is, uh, in a sense, bears the image of the, uh, her nation. An ambassador of Christ, he represents the interests and values and intentions and expectations of the country that send them to a foreign country, right? Uh, and to do their job well, they need to know a little bit, right? <laughs> they need to do a little bit of study. Education is important there. Uh, they must go through all kinds of studies and then uh, they must understand uh, the nation's domestic policies and uh, uh, the foreign policies and uh, uh, the nation's interest, and you know what? B by and large, uh, um, uh, how does who appoints an ambassador here in, in our country? The president. Uh, you know the you know he serves by the pleasure of the president. That's that's his job. You know whoever he picks up in his uh, under his pleasure. So, isn't it wonderful that God is pleased to pick you and me the most? unworthy people in the world, the people who think they are, they are good for nothing kind of people, Christians, they, all they can talk about is Jesus, they, can, they don't know anything else, but God looks at them and says, hey, you 
are my ambassador. Do you say amen for that one more time? Amen. Ambassador for Christ. That is the honor, honorable thing, title that you can wear proudly wherever you go as an ambassador of Christ. If the, if the earthly ambassadors go through all that, it must be with us the same way. What are we to do as an ambassadors of God? We are the image bearers of Christ. We are to reflect the nature and the character of God. We are to share his interest with the rest of the world. We are to uh, stand up for him and speak for him in this world, wherever we go. In your classroom or in your marketplace, you are going to sp stand up and speak for, for the one who sent you, the one who is uh, pleased with you. That is God. And that's what we're going to do as an ambassadors of Christ. So we need to be equipping ourselves with, with God's word. We need to read the, the word of God. That's why we instill that, read your Bible. Paul was talking with uh, uh, one uh, young ambassador uh, uh, for Christ in, during his time. His name was Timothy. What did he speak to him? How did he prepare him for the job that God gave him? In uh, 2 Timothy, 2 chapter, verse Verse 15. Let's, let's read that. He says, Work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the words of truth. So the manual that God put for us is this. It contains, if you think the people go by the constitution in this world, in our country, the constitution plays a great role. For you and the Christians, the constitution is the word of God. So you need to know what is in the pages of this Bible. Amen? So that means you got to open the Bible, not keep it on the shelf there and get it dusty. You know, if it is in the basement somewhere, go out, dust it off, and start reading. Open the Bible. That's where you get it. Not on the internet or, uh, or, or somewhere else, but just get into these pages of the Bible. Let me give you an example. As a five-year-old kid, I was so excited to read the Bible. My, we used to have a family uh, Bible uh, times uh, after dinner. Before we get up from the table, we would read from the Bible. My dad would say, who would read the Bible? Me, I want to read. So I would, at the, even at that age, I had the, such desire to read the Bible. When I got saved when I, at uh, age 18, back in India, we don't have this kind of uh, small jobs where you can work in uh, uh, shawls or uh, you know, pack, you know, little, little jobs that you do can earn money as a young kid. We, have, we, have, we don't have those things. But I had an opportunity to do some job. And then I got my first, first uh, uh, money in my hand. You know what I did with that first amount of money that I got? I went and I bought a Bible. I wanted to have my own Bible for myself. And that was the desire that I had gotten into it many, many times. And I tell you, my wife tells me, Francis, you've got one weakness that is called the Bibles. You know, I have so many Bibles in my, you know, all kinds of Bibles. If you, if you come to my books uh, library, I have more Bibles than the books. <laughs> you know, just that's the desire you need to have. That will stay with you in times of trouble, hard time, wherever you go. Because the word of God you're de depositing inside of you. So Paul was saying, Approve, read yourself as a, an approved worker of God. Dear friends, let me, ex let me conclude this by saying, to the extent we read and study God's word, to that extent we will come to know God. You cannot know God apart from reading the word of God. His plans for your life and his plans for the world and his plans for people, you can only know by reading the word of God. So, is one thing to put on this badge of honor. 
and ambassadors for Christ. Another thing is that we would do all that we can do to equip ourselves so we can represent Christ better in this world in a right way. Not in the wrong way, but in the right way. So as the, uh, uh, John, would you come on up, please, leading us into, uh, as we begin to wrap our, our, our uh, wor uh, word today. I cannot overemphasize uh, uh, the, the honor that God places on his people. The word of God tells us how beautiful, how pleasant and beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Amen. There are many in India, there are ambassadors for Christ. All those who are listening to me from uh, live stream, you are an ambassador of Christ in a very difficult situation where you are. But yet, you are representing the most high God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the, crea the creator of the whole universe. What an honor for God to look at you and me as if he cannot find a better person. He turns to me and to you and say, would you be my ambassador? Would you, can I, can I, can you serve me? Or, uh, uh, I take so delight in you, so much pleasure in you that you go out. And what you would say, yes, Lord, here am I. Send me into the world. Amen. So wherever he will send you, you will follow Whatever he will feed you, you will swallow. And be ready for surprises. I've done that all these years of my ministry with Youth with the Mission, traveling to many countries and bringing the good news of the gospel. I get excited about telling about my Savior. And I'm not ashamed of Jesus. In the, in the town hall, in Sharon, wherever I go, when I get an opportunity, I preach the name of Jesus. My interfaith friends would tell me, would you not please say this, that, and all? You know, don't talk about God. I said, hey, this is my, my faith. You call me to pray, so that's what I do. <laughs> don't call me otherwise. But if you do call me, I will stand up and pray in the name of Jesus. So would you stand up together? As you're standing up, let that confidence rise up in you you look like an ambassador i see many ambassadors here you look like one kathy you are an ambassador for christ i look i see one day at the road you look like one an ambassador and naomi and sophia and uh, and uh, and I, uh, anya you know all these young ones here joe you are an ambassador for christ don't worry about your mcas score even if you get a zero, you're an ambassador for Christ. Don't get zero, okay? Because uh, dad doesn't like that. But we are. God is calling us to be part of his army. I, I love that song, John. You know, rise up church, be the part of God's army. God is looking for, for, uh, for soldiers, for ambassadors, for all kinds of workers in his kingdom. Amen. So John, whatever you have, lead us on. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow unto the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven, on earth, shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne and worship. You will be exalted, O God. of days blessing and honor glory and power be until the ancient of days oh from every nation all of creation bow into the ancient of Glory, every knee shall bow at the throne and worship. 
worship, you will be exalted, O God, and your kingdom shall not pass away. O Ancient of Days. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's put our hands together and give glory to God. Hallelujah, Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have placed us a high call. You're calling us to a high bar of responsibility to be the ambassadors of Christ. Oh, let that sink in us as we walk out. We walk out with the dignity, with that honor, awesome responsibility, knowing that you are sending us into the world to be your representatives. In us, we cannot do, but Lord, the Holy Spirit will give us the grace and the strength to stand up for you when the time comes. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. The love of the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the, the, the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit, the, the empowering power of the Holy Spirit will be with us forever and ever. Amen. And maybe some of you will see you at the lake in a little while.